Well, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to a place where we can come together to open up the Word of God and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us about Jesus Christ and about our eternal salvation that is in Him. Now, today happens to be Palm Sunday. And I began, I was reading some things, some, some events, some accounts about things that happened around that time when Jesus came and entered into Jerusalem in a fulfillment of prophecy. And as we were reading some of those accounts, uh, one thing that came to mind was that Jesus had some encounters with people around Jericho before he got to Jerusalem. It was uh, some miles in between, and there was a couple of accounts where it says it's as he was leaving Jericho, in one case in the book of Mark, he met Bartimaeus, a blind man who wanted to be able to see, and Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? And I said, I want to be able to see, and he healed him, and he could see, and, and Jesus told him that it was by his faith that he was healed. Another time it says he was leaving Jericho again, the same situation, and he met Zacchaeus. And you have all of that account with Zacchaeus going up in the tree and so forth, and he, then he went into his home, and, and salvation came to Zacchaeus that day. And it says right then, after that account about Zacchaeus, that the people believed that the kingdom of God was just about to appear. And he tells them a parable. This is in Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, he tells them a parable about a nobleman who delivered ten talents unto his, uh, his uh, servants, and he went away to a far country to obtain a kingdom. And the, but the people would not have him to reign over them. Now, that, that is so fascinating that Jesus would stop at that moment when sensing that the people were believed that the kingdom of God was about to appear. And he tells us an account about a king leaving to obtain his kingdom, and then he came back, and he reckoned with those servants. And the first comment that he made to the first servant was, you have been faithful in a very little so as I was reading some of these accounts, I began to think about faith and belief. And, and that's what we do. We think about things like that in the Bible. And as a human, as a person, we have our point of view about what is faith, what is belief, or what is faithlessness, or what is unbelief. And I have my human view of those things. But in this parable... Jesus is giving us, once again, instruction about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And God has a view of what our faith and our belief is. Now, this is what transformed my thinking just a little bit. God has a different view about my faith and my belief in him than what I do. Now... <clears throat> Hold that thought in that parable in Luke 19. And I began to think about faith a little bit, and there's, uh, there were a couple of phrases going through my mind, and I turned to Matthew 17. If you want to turn there just for a moment, Matthew 17. <clears throat> and this, was, this account is about a situation where there was a man who had a son who was demon-possessed. In some places described as lunatic, and he was vexed, and he was throwing himself in the fire and in the water. And he, and he came, he brought this son to the, Jesus' disciples, and they weren't able to heal him or, or to throw out that demon. And Jesus came to that scene, and he removed the demon. It tells us here in this chapter 17 of Matthew, and we're down in around verses 14 to 23 here. But, uh, and then the disciples are concerned about this because they ask Jesus a little bit later. He's, it says in verse 19, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith, as a grain of mustard seed. You shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. 
Jesus just gave us an amazing perspective, a kingdom understanding of belief. He said, if you just have faith and belief, even as tiny, as minuscule, as a grain of mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible to you in the kingdom of heaven. That's an astounding perspective. That's not a human perspective. That's why it's so amazing to read that and you think, what does that mean? Well, that's a kingdom perspective. And then another, another passage came to mind, and I was thinking, well, there's something else that's very similar. And over in Mark chapter 9, if you turn there br just briefly, Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29, it's actually the same account, the same situation. A man had a son who was lunatic, who was vexed in his spirit, and he came to Jesus to have this, this son healed from this. <clears throat> Mark chapter 9. 14 to 29. We're not going to read the whole thing here. But it's the same situation is being described. And he saw, Jesus walked up on this, and he saw these scribes gathered around his, his disciples. And he walked up and said, why are you questioning them? And, and they said, well, there's this man here who has this son. And your disciples weren't able to help him. And Jesus <clears throat> then heals the son. And the demon is cast away. And it says in verse 21, he asked the father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oft times it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now, that's a kingdom perspective of belief. It was so, you know, it's almost ironic how Jesus turns this man's question. The man, you know, had asked him, uh, if, if you can do anything. He's talking to God here. Maybe he didn't really understand it, but he, he said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can believe, anything is possible. To the person that can believe. <clears throat> and then the man says, and straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. You know, that, that's where humans are. <laughs> that's where we are. We, we believe, we understand, we have faith. <clears throat> but father, father, help me with the, all the parts that I don't know how to believe. I don't know how to have faith like I should or I need to. But in a kingdom perspective, Jesus is teaching us here, if you have faith, if you have belief, and, and we, first it was a lesson to the apostles in the first passage, and this, this time it's a lesson being taught to that man directly. In the kingdom perspective, if you have belief, nothing is impossible to you in the kingdom of God. Now, let's turn back to Luke chapter 19 and finish right there. Luke chapter 19, this parable that Jesus stopped somewhere between Jericho and, and going into Jerusalem. And right after this parable is the entry into Jerusalem, it says in this various chapter here. <clears throat> he stops and he gives this parable about this nobleman that is going to go into a far country because the people wouldn't have this man reign over them. And he, was gonna, he went and he distributed things to his, his servants. And then he comes back to reckon them. <clears throat> Verse 16 of, this is Luke 19, 16. Then came the first, uh, meaning servant, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little. Now get, get that phrase. <clears throat> because you have been faithful in a very little. Then the next phrase is this. Have thou authority over ten cities? And we read that mind with a human skeptical mind. <laughs> or we read that phrase, what? <laughs> One pound becomes ten and, you, and you're given authority over ten cities? 
This is so far beyond human thinking. This is kingdom thinking. That God looks at our faith, at our belief, our faithfulness, he says, that being full of faith over a, such a little thing. But in the kingdom, God has a view of that, that that is worthy or that will be awarded authority in a massive way. There is no human perspective that could explain the kingdom of heaven. And God is so anxious for us to understand those things. That our faith will become faithful and that our belief, even as little as a tiny mustard seed, God is looking for that and he wants to be in the middle of that. All that we might learn to have a kingdom understanding of these things. So what's on your heart today? Reports or praises? Prayer concerns? Before we, as we go to prayer, let's remember, remember our brother Mark Ray in Indiana who had, had a heart attack and he had a stent put in. He's maybe looking at one or two other stents on Monday. And, uh, but he's resting in the hospital there in Indianapolis. Other thoughts or concerns for prayer? Yes. Let's have prayer for Stanley and Evelyn, Evelyn Schellebarger. <clears throat> okay. Other thoughts or concerns? Yes. Let's continue to pray for Don and Jackie with Jackie's uh, uh, surgical situation and the tumor and, and so forth. And what we don't know what all her condition is, but let's continue to hold her up in prayer. Others? Would you join us now in prayer? O oh, Father, Lord, God in, in heaven, by your Holy Spirit only can we come to you. We thank you, Father, that you afford us the ability and the power to step into your presence and to bring the things that are on our hearts and the people that we're concerned about. And Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the, this, the power of, of coming together and being in the word and, and just knowing that you are uh, not just a theoretical God. You're, you're not just an intellectual God. You are the God that is indwelling right inside of us and that you have made ways to save us and to give us the ability to know your will and to, and to be able to walk in, in faith in this life, and also that there are amazing promises yet to be fulfilled when we leave this world. Oh, Father, we thank you for <laughs> these concerns for the Shellebargers, that the, we need to uphold our friends and, and those that are struggling in various kinds of, of ways. We think also of our brother Mark and helping Father to, to be healed, help the, the surgeons as they make decisions to, to guide him and to assist the things that he needs there, Father, just be with him, helping to be at peace with this and helping to be healed. Oh, Father, we think of Don and Jackie and, and Jackie's great need of, and her physical <coughs> problem that whatever that is that was removed from her, her mind, from her head, Father, and just pray for healing and we pray for what's ahead that we don't fully understand. Oh, Father, help us to uh, be remembering people that are, have great challenges in their lives and that we individually, Father, we need you every day. We need you. We don't want to forget you. Help us to be mindful of your kingdom in this world to help us give, a, give us a heavenly understanding and a heavenly perspective that will guide and direct our words and our actions in this life. Oh, Father, we just thank you for each one that's here. We pray your blessing upon the hearts that are here and the minds. 
We pray our, our especially a blessing upon our brother Clem as, as he shares things today, <clears throat> very personal things, and we just uh, are excited because we know that you have been working and that there have been answers to prayer. Oh, Father, we pray your blessing upon this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Brother David asked if I had anything uh, for him to open with, and, and I said I didn't, but, but God gave him a very excellent opening for the message today. I appreciate what he shared as he spoke of faith and believing, even in the little things, but believing what God can do. Brother asked us to, to speak this morning, and, and he suggested that maybe we could share some of our story when we were in Ethiopia recently, if it was appropriate. And so today, there will be some of that story in this message. It's not going to be too personal. This isn't really my story. But I'm going to share some of our family story with you. And I don't know what you will do with it. I don't know what God will do with it. But let me tell you a story. I don't tell you this for you to know all about our lives. In fact, I would ask you to be considerate and sensitive if you have questions about this afterwards, especially for the children. I don't share it because we did everything right. I don't share it for you to sit back and be entertained. I share it as a blessing with a desire to be a blessing, to share the blessing of the faithful and the faithfulness of the God that we serve when we will seek him with hope. <clears throat> Today, we're going to talk about answered prayers. And I know that there's some of you sitting here today with unanswered prayers. And it's not easy. I've been there. I'm still there. We've all experienced that. And as I thought about unanswered prayers and answered prayers, I thought in Matthew 15... Another person with faith, Matthew 15, I'm going to read a few verses from here, of this woman that met with Jesus. And here's what it says in Matthew 15, beginning in verse 22, Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the coast and cried unto him, speaking of Jesus, saying, 
Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. Have you ever prayed? And it seemed as though your prayer was ignored. That's kind of what happened here, it appears. Jesus didn't even acknowledge her. I've prayed and felt like my prayer was not even acknowledged. And his disciples came, it gets worse, and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. She's just a troublemaker. She's annoying. She's out of her mind. I don't know what they might have been suggesting here, but let's send her away. They suggested, well, this, this gets Jesus' attention. Jesus doesn't want to send her away, and he does now acknowledge her. Now, as I thought about the, this woman crying after us, um, when we were in Ethiopia, there were a lot of beggars there. But it was a different um, demographic, maybe, than what we're used to here. A lot of times it's mid to older men and women begging a lot of times. But, but there were a lot of young women there with babies who were begging. And there were a lot of children begging. And they were very persistent. Um, they would come to you, and it wasn't um, problematic, or uh, there just wasn't anything really too difficult about it, but they were persistent. They continued to ask. We would even be in the van, and, and they would ask, and then you would go on up the street a ways, and they'd show right back up. You know, they followed you. They, they, it reminded me of this woman. Jesus answered this woman in verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Basically, what I hear him saying is, I hear Jewish prayers. Like, I hear some people's prayers, but I don't hear yours today. And I've experienced that feeling. I've seen other people's prayers get answered and mine are not being answered. But she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, True, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, Great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. I can relate in some ways as I have prayed to what this woman went through. I believe many of you can too. She didn't take no for an answer. She hung on in faith, believing and knowing that this Jesus, this Lord, the Son of David, was her only hope in the situation she was in. Jesus cites her faith as a reason for granting her request. And, and so sometimes this verse can be used to, to even be critical of one's faith. So if I was praying for someone who was sick and they ended up dying, or if I was praying for a relationship and ended up falling apart, one might say, well, you just didn't have enough faith. And with me, that may be true at times, but, but that's not the defining factor on whether our request is granted. Always. There was a man with great faith who prayed and his, his request was not granted. His name was Jesus. When he was in the garden, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. And that request was not granted in the way that he asked it, was it? And so, I would submit... that God was working in both of those situations. In both of those prayers, he was working all things together for good for those that love him. Sometimes you and I are called to suffer for Christ, to suffer like Christ, and to suffer with Christ. And Sometimes we need to endure the pain. We need to wait on God. We need to trust that his ways are right. I know that doesn't make it easy. Well, let me tell you a story. Fourteen years ago today, we were in Ethiopia. It was the first time that Bev and I got to hold our, our two children, Camille and Pierre. And on March 26th of 2010, we flew home to America. Here's a picture 
of us in the airport when we got home. Through a series of experiences, God's direction, and opening of doors, Bev and I felt a call to adopt. And though it's not without heartache and difficulty, we have seen God's hand of faithfulness and blessing time and time again. It wasn't long after we got home through our limited broken communication with Camille that we understood that she had a brother, an older brother, who was very special to her. And ever since that flight home 14 years ago, Camille has prayed for her brother. She has longed to see him again, to know him again, to thank him for what he meant to her. Bev and I have prayed for her brother. Some of you have. She's wanted to go and find him for a long time. But it's never worked. The time was never right until this year. The time was right. And just a month before the 14th anniversary of that adoption, we were able to once again travel to Ethiopia, just the four of us, and we had a big goal. We didn't know if it would be achieved, but we were trusting God with the details. Our desire was this, to walk in the village where they were born and to find their brother, Indala, and their aunt. We went with three clues. On the birth certificate that we had, there was a town name of Hawassa. We had an adoption file number on one of the papers that we had. And we had a picture of the children when they were five and two with their aunt, who had taken them to the orphanage. So we flew to Addis Ababa, and we drove five hours south to the city of Hawassa, the only place we knew to go. We had intended to go to a court before and to try to find that adoption file and get more information, but someone told us that it would take a long time and there would be um, women's affairs, places we could go in Hawassa to, to get information, and so we, uh, we just went straight to Hawassa. One problem. <laughs> Hawassa has 436,000 people living in it. We were heading there to look for a needle in a haystack. I have always believed that we would be able to find their family sometime. I knew that God could allow us to find their family on this trip. I didn't believe necessarily that he would. Bev was her overly optimistic self and was planning on going there and finding them and spending a few days with them. Poor Camille and Pierre, you know, they were stuck between our outlooks. But um, Camille has always believed that God would make a way for her to meet her brother again. And that has always been her prayer. So our driver told us, we made it to Haas, our driver told us he would pick us up the next morning and... We get up the next morning, and he's late. Well, he had already went to a women and children's affair and tried to get some information. He showed up to get us with three men um, that wanted to help us. They had worked there, and they just quit their job for the day and wanted to come help us with what we were trying to do. And so here's a picture just of us in the van with a couple men at that time, and there's Pierre in the back seat talking about America and Joe Biden and the broken English that that man had. Uh, and there is the first place that we went. We went to another women's and children's affairs and spoke with that woman. And she gave us a, the name of a, a woman to go talk to that was involved with adoptions prior. And so we had to go try to find this woman, and she was at a funeral. So we go to the funeral, they go talk to her. We didn't know it, but, know it, but a small detail. She didn't know anything about this picture, but a woman that was with her took a picture of the picture. God is working in the details. We drive around. 
and we would ask people if they recognize this picture. We're in this city of 436,000 people, and most of the time it was a no, but, but then all of a sudden we got someone. They said yes. So they talked a little bit, we loaded them up in the van, and we drove to where they were taking us. And you kind of get excited, and your hopes get up. And we get there, knock on the gate. It was the wrong, wrong person. Kind of back there. So we'd ask her out of that area. And we got somebody else. Yes, yes, I know her. She got a disease, and her lips turned white, and uh, we will take you to her. So we go again. And we did this many times, and every time it was the wrong person. It's kind of a roller coaster of emotions. Hope would flame up, and then it would quickly go out, leaving you perhaps more hopeless than before. It's especially hard on Camille. But have you ever been on this kind of a ro emotional roller coaster in your life? Or something gives you hope only to have the rug pulled out from under you. And it happens again and again. For some of you younger people, it could be in searching for a spouse. And maybe you think that there's somebody that notices you. Or you think that there's an opportunity. Or you think someone's nice. And, and you think maybe God's opening a door and all of a sudden it slams. And, it, and sometimes that can happen multiple times. And it, it's difficult, isn't it? Maybe it's a job that you're wanting to get or trying for. These roller coasters, they are a real part of life. This was an intense few days of one, but we all have those in different ways. Maybe as, you, as you're older, maybe it's um, in your relationship with your children or children's relationship with each other or something that, that you continually pray for and you hope for, and you get a glimpse of hope and then something goes backwards again. We can all relate. Maybe it's your health to this roller coaster. But speaking of Abraham, in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Who against hope believed in hope? He against hope believed in hope. And it was kind of what we were doing here. Because you get to the point where you're a little cynical. And you don't want to hope anymore. But against hope, we continue to believe in hope. It was kind of like Psalms 84 says, they go, it, it speaks of walking through the valley of weeping. It calls it Baca or Raka or something. But, uh, and it talks about that valley being filled with tears. It says they go from strength to strength, every one of them appearing before God. We go from strength to strength in our daily lives, even as we find ourselves on a roller coaster. So we continue doing the same thing over and over, driving around all day for a couple days seeming that maybe we were wasting our time my realistic outlook got to the point that we needed to do something different we still had the adoption file we needed to go back to Addis we need to go to the court we need to find the adoption file we need to get some information that can actually lead us somewhere instead of driving around in circles so we got back to the hotel one day and had some hard conversations about what to do next and that's what we decided to do so Thursday morning, we headed back to Addis, tried to find a court that might have some helpful information. We arrived, arrived at the first court, and they sent us through the court, into the courtyard behind it, past some buildings, some piles of junk, to a room, a building, that looked like this. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot about that. That was just some pic a picture of us searching some different places. There's no electronic files there. So we, we came to this room and it was just aisles and aisles of files. We, we communicated with the woman there and she, uh, she looked for a little, and then she said, she told us that we would have to go to another court that had adoptions, had done adoptions. We didn't know. I mean, it's been 14 years. The city's changed a lot. We didn't really know what court it was that we were at before. Um, and, but she said she called them, and they were too busy today. They would help us tomorrow. So the next morning, we went 
to that court and we had to wait for quite a while and we got we finally were called down to the woman's office and it was in the basement we get down there appears like this so this ain't a court this is a parking garage and that's what it was and but her you know over the door there it said old files so once again we got to the files but we got to got to her desk and she had a file laying on her desk and had the file number, same one as our adoption file. And hope arises. Maybe we're going to get somewhere. And she opens the file, and it's an adoption file. And then we put, look through a couple papers, and it's the wrong people. It's the wrong adoption file. And it's Friday morning, and we're to fly out. We're to leave for the airport at 6.30 Friday evening. And the roller coaster kind of crashed and burned. It's kind of like your last chance there. So we had to go to the right court. We thought about trying another court later that day, just before we left. But we went. This is when we went to Cora. After that, and I've shared with you a little about Cora. Um, we went to Cora, but on our way to Cora. Busy, our driver got a phone call that said that someone knew where the aunt lived and wanted to video call us. I don't think he believed them. But we went ahead and went to Cora, and as we left, a few hours later, we got a video call. And so he pulls over to the side of the road and gets it connected, and there on the screen, for all of us to clearly see, was the aunt. There was no doubt about it. She had been found. It was a bit of a shocking moment. It was an awesome moment. A feeling of deep gratitude just kind of came over me as I sat there and I watched the children speak with their aunt. God was answering prayers. It was amazing to watch, but my mind is frantically wondering, God, what is this all about? We're getting ready to leave. In two and a half hours, we're supposed to leave for the airport. Why now? In the video call, the aunt told the children that Indala, their brother, lived nearby. And she told them that she always prayed that God would let her see them again before she died. For 14 years, their aunt had been praying. For over 14 years, Camille had been praying. Others had prayed. Some of you have prayed. For 14 years, it seemed almost as though nothing had changed. We had gotten no information. We, we had hired an investigator and seemingly gotten nowhere with that. And in this moment, God was answering 14 years of prayers. And I, I knew that we had to go and see them. And so we did, though not without difficulty. With the help of God, we were able to purchase some different plane tickets. And Bizra, who never says no, said he would drive us the five and a half hours to this village of Lekou, which is about a half hour from where we had been before, outside of that city. So we met the lady who had found them, and she took us to them. So just to explain to you how that it happened, I don't think it diminishes the miracle, but God can, God can use, he uses all of us, and he uses everything we have available to work his miracles. But remember, I told you that the first lady that we had went to, to talk to, didn't know anything about the aunt, but the lady beside her took a picture. And she had a Facebook account. And she posted it on her Facebook account. Now in this village of Lekou, there's really no one there that has Facebook and smartphones. They would be very, very, very few. But there was a wealthy woman who lived from, was from Lekou. She had a house that sounded like in Lekou and in Hawassa. And she had a Facebook account. And she, wrecked, she was friends of the daughter of the aunt. And it was through that connection 
really the first place that we stopped, God used to connect us. It was pretty awesome. Here's, here's the woman and her, her two daughters that found the ant for us and video called us. We finally got there and it was, it was a beautiful reunion. When they met, it was, there was no doubt, there was no hesitation. As Camille said, it's kind of like a puzzle piece that just fit. Fourteen years of separation, fourteen years of prayers. God had heard, God had answered, God had worked a miracle. And as I look back over it, I see that God wrote this story, God was in the details, and all along the way there were many ordinary heroes that he used. I will show you a picture here of the aunt and the brother with us. And here's Camille and her brother. And Dalla. And this is what happens after a trip like that. <laughs> 14 years. Let's think about that for a little bit. How long have you been praying for something or for someone? How are you believing in the faithfulness of God? Does it ever feel like the Syrophoenician woman where God's not hearing? God's only answering other prayers? Does it feel like he doesn't care? If we are praying after the pattern of Jesus in the garden, he prayed, not my will, but thine be done, O oh Lord. And if we can pray with that heart, then we can rest assured that that is exactly what is being done. The Lord's will in the Lord's time. I'm sure that some of you have prayed for something for 14 years. Some of you have prayed for longer than that. And you still haven't seen it answered. Remember, Isaiah says, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than ours. And his perspective is so much clearer than ours. Remember, Jesus prayed a prayer. It wasn't answered in the way that he had asked it. I thought about the length of time of, of these prayers, and I remember the woman who met Jesus in Mark chapter 5. And this was the woman who had had the issue of blood for 12 years, it said. And it says that she suffered many things of many physicians, spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. And when she heard of Jesus, came in, pressed behind, and touched his garment, for she said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Continue to pray. And press into Jesus. I want to testify that no matter how long it takes to get answered, whether it's 12 years, 14 years, 39 years, God is hearing that prayer. He is always hearing our prayers, and he comes in his time. And it's always just the right time. Now, as I stood there and I watched our children interact with their family, I'm certain there could have not been a better time for that to happen. I believe it was God's time. And I believe that over the years of waiting, God was working even when we can't fully understand. <clears throat> I appreciate the words of encouragement that Romans chapter 8 has, where it speaks of hope and prayer and intercession of the Spirit on our behalf. And I just want to read a few of these verses from here. Romans chapter 8, I think we'll just 
22, we, we know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, not only they, but, our, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. That line de describes Camille's prayer. She prayed with hope, and she with patience waited for it. Do we pray with hope? Do we pray for things that we can see or that we can't see? If we're praying for things that we can see, we are not praying with hope. Like when I pray the words, thy will be done, I mean it to a point. But often my day is already filled. I know what's going to happen. And barring some unforeseen event, I know where my breakfast, lunch, and dinner is coming from. I know who I'm meeting with and what we're talking about. I know... I mean, there's lots of unknowns, but generally speaking, most of us kind of have our day figured out, and yet we pray, thy will be done. I think sometimes I mean, thy will be done if it has to be, if it gets to that point. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There are going to be days, and you can't even put into words the things that you're feeling. Those days of roller coasters, those days that get really hard, you can't say things, maybe hardly at all. You, can't, you don't know what to pray. Have you ever been there? You just don't even know what to say. You can't say the right things to God. In those moments, I would just encourage you to lean into God. To press into Jesus. Just to get a little closer. Let him hold you. The, the Spirit. Yeah, it says here, the Spirit makes intercession for us. Let the Spirit speak for you. When you don't know what to say, it says groanings that can't be under, uttered, it can translate for us. Let the Spirit speak for you. Sometimes you can pray even as you're writing your feelings and your emotions, and that can be a prayer. Don't think that it has to be just the right words to talk to God. He that searcheth, verse 27, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's the beautiful thing. As the Spirit intercedes for us, it's according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. If you have made Jesus the Lord of your life, then this verse speaking about you. I want you to believe in the power of prayer. I want you to believe in a faithful God. I want that for myself because so many times I forget. I forget the amazing things that God has done for me. I forget the powerful ways that He showed up. I'm no different than the children of Israel forgetting about the pillar of fire, forgetting about the Red Sea. Over and over we forget the miracles of God, the powerful ways even that he's worked in our lives. Just a few verses I want to read to leave with you. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. 2 Peter 3, 8 speaks of this. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. With Peter's math, what does that make 14 years? Patience. 
Genesis 18, 14, is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return unto you, he said. Luke 18, 27, but he said, that what is impossible with man is possible with God. I fully believe that our goal would not have been reached without God working out the details. Micah 7, 7, therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah 7, 7. Lamentations 3, 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. As we close, I just had this thought that I wanted to share As we consider our participation with God in our prayers, I don't know that I'm going to word it just right. But our part in the story, one thing that I believe is that if Camille would not have gone back to Ethiopia, she probably wouldn't have met her brother. My point is that God is doing big things in this world on a daily basis. The question is whether I want to do it with him. Whether I want to be involved in that work. Whether I want to recognize the blessings that God is performing. The miracles that God is performing. And in our prayers, there are, along with our prayers, there are steps that some of us have to make. There are places that some of us have to go. If you want to see God answer your prayer, be willing to step out in faith. Sometimes it's not easy. You step out and you get stepped on. You step out and you're on a roller coaster. But when we pray for something and refuse to participate in that prayer because we expect God to answer in a specific way, we miss out on a blessing. Bart has shared an example of, of a man who was stuck on a boat that was sinking. I, I don't remember the details, but it was going down, and he, had, he prayed that God would deliver him. And he, there was three different ways he could have been gotten off of that boat, but he was waiting on God to save him. And sometimes we tend to get stuck in what we think needs to happen, in the way we think needs to happen. Camille had the ability to go to Ethiopia, and she was blessed in that. God blessed that. <clears throat> I think about the tornadoes that went through, and I think about how easy it was for me to pray for those people, and how much harder it was to actually go and help out. A.W. Tozer said this, We hear a Christian assure someone that he will pray over his problem knowing full well that he intends to use prayer as a substitute for service. It is much easier to pray that a poor friend's needs may be supplied than it is to supply them. After I read that, I thought of this other similar story that I had. It said a church gathered to pray for a needy family around Thanksgiving. When the family needed food and concerned folks from the church got together to pray for them. While the prayer meeting was going on, a young boy came and knocked on the door of the home where the members had gathered, entered the house, and told them, My father said to tell you that he can't come tonight to pray because he is too busy unloading his prayers at the Joneses' house. He said to tell you that he is taking a side of beef, a sack of potatoes, a bushel of apples, and some jars of jam. He said he could not be here to pray, but that he has taken his prayers and unloaded them at their house. And sometimes... I'm not minimizing prayer whatsoever. It's powerful. And we probably need to pray more. But we also need to be discerning because sometimes we have an opportunity to unload our prayers. Let's make sure as Christians we don't get into the habit of praying for things when we could actually be God's hands and feet and do something about it. I believe that along with our prayers that we pray comes a responsibility to act as we have opportunity. It's not that we are going and answering the prayers ourselves. But when we make an effort, 
and we make a difference. One person at a time, one yard at a time, one listening ear at a time, one sponsorship at a time, one mission trip at a time, one grocery cart at a time, one foster child at a time. I don't know what it is for you, but I know that when we trust God and pray with hope, we are going to have a story to tell. Even if it takes 14 years to write, it's not our story, it's God's. My wife sent me this song that I believe describes the story that we shared today. There's torn up pages in this book. Words that tell me I'm no good. Chapters that define me for so long. But the hands of grace and endless love dusted off and picked me up. Told my heart that hope is never gone. God is in this story. God is in the details. Even in the broken parts, he holds my heart. He never fails. When I'm at my weakest, I will trust in Jesus. Always in the highs and lows, the one who goes before me. God is in this story. So if the storm you're walking through feels like it's too much, and you wonder if he even cares at all, hold on tight to what you know. He promised he won't let you go. The song of healing is written in his scars. God is in this story. God is in the details. Even in the broken parts, he holds my heart. He never fails. When I'm at my weakest, I will trust in Jesus. Always in the highs and lows, the one who goes before me. God is in this story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a great God. We thank you for seeing things that we can't see in ways that we can't see. We thank you that we don't have to go this life alone, that we don't have to figure everything out. Lord, I just pray this morning that you would strengthen every heart, every one of us here, that you would strengthen our faith and our trust in you. Lord, that, that you could say to us, woman, man, great is thy faith. As we persistently, with hope, seek after you. Lord, life gets really busy, and it gets really heavy. It gets really hard sometimes. We don't know which way to turn. We don't even know how to pray. Lord, I pray for your spirit, your Holy Spirit, your comforter, to fill us, to walk beside us, and to hold us on those days. Lord, I thank you for the powerful answer to prayer that you did in our family's life. Just pray that we would remember it and that we would trust you to continue to answer our prayers in your time. Thank you for each one who's here. Lord, I pray that we would go out this week, that we'd be a light for you, that we'd make a difference in this world, that we would pray and that we would unload our prayers as we have opportunity. Lord, I thank you for the children and I just pray for them as they grow. Lord, that you would protect them that you would call them and draw them to you, that they would become men and women who love you with their whole heart for their whole life. Go with us today. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for our sins and to give us hope of a future with no pain and with no tears, with no separation. We look forward to that day in Jesus' name. Amen.